start by telling you where I started with this. I was doing development office work for a university in the States, and I was active in a couple of advocacy groups. And one of them was an advocacy group for children's television. And we were trying to figure out why none of the Federal Communications Commission's guidelines seemed to be causing any sort of a change at all in the behavior of the stations. So that led me to go back to graduate school to learn how organizations worked. And that led me eventually to a professor by the name of Barry Clemson, who was in Norfolk, Virginia, by the way, uh, who was then teaching at the University of Maryland. And he introduced me first to Ross Ashby's work, along with, obviously, the whole rest of the class, and then to Stafford's work. So I was already trying to use Stafford's work when I went to a combined American Society for Cybernetics, International Society for System Science Research uh, Project conference that was held in Toronto, which I didn't live there then, but now I do. And it was going to be followed by one of Barry's seminars that was featuring Stafford as the essentially weekend, well, he, had, he did these weekend visiting cybernetician seminars that would go on for ages and ages and, you know, in past midnight and stuff like that. And sometimes Stafford came. Um, he got Fernando Flores. Uh, he, he got Heinz von Forster. Uh, he got all sorts of people. And at that, uh, that weekend, uh, I met Stafford, we, and we began a collaboration that uh, began as a, a professional one and then turned into a personal one. So we worked together for a long time until he died in, like, in 2002. But that brings me to where he and the rest of them got started, because many of the men in his generation were very much influenced by World War II. Stafford himself uh, went and enlisted at age 18, having completed exactly one year of university at UCL, and tried to pack as much into that as possible. Uh, he ended up in India doing what then uh, was recognized as operational research, a symbolic logic to predict where the next patches were going to make a move. He came back and worked on human <coughs> factors. When he attempted to go back to university, uh, the dean said that uh, he would have to start all over again and that he'd be on probation. Because even though his grades were good, he had been interested in too many things that he had to settle down and just pick one thing and they were going to let him start over because they were going to be real kind. And this, this was after others in, in the group, his faculty uh, members, had been saying, essentially, come, come work with me and do your doctorate. Well, uh, that didn't go down very well. So Stafford basically saluted the guy, told him where to put it, and went to work in, as a trainee for the, US, the British steel industry. And that's where he started as a, a trainee, then a production controller, uh, worked up to the point where he was employing 50-odd people from a multi multidisciplinary background at Cyborg House, it began with things like uh, doing mass batteries for control charts and other essentially mostly analog measures for production control types of things. He began working with Warren McCullough, who was a cybernetician in the state, a uh, psychiatrist. Ashby was a psychiatrist. He met Wiener. And after he read Wiener's book in 1950, he sent off a letter and he said, I think I'm a cybernetician, because he had been doing what he thought was OR. And that was fine. But OR was beginning even then to be, be becoming, you know, kind of oriented towards solving problems that had been defined. You know, queuing theory, linear programming, you know, how, how many packets could you put in a, in a container, that sort of thing. And all of these are real problems, 
but they did not carry on the original operational research um, <coughs> mode of doing stuff to improve operations on the basis of what it looked like the problem might be. And so the early OR people were very multidisciplinary. Uh, they were rewarded by that, by certain advantages that they got during the war from being multidisciplinary. Uh, one of the, the interesting things was that, that kind of reflected some of what we talked about at Metaforum, was that when the uh, RAF uh, Spitfire and bomber pilots started coming back from their raids in World War II, uh, the operational <coughs> research people said, look at the ones that come back and see what, see what was a sufficient amount of fuselage and equipment and whatever to get them home. That's what we need to strengthen. Obviously, they got back without A, B, and C, so maybe we don't need to worry so much about protecting those. Let's protect the bits that did get them back. And it was that kind of way of turning a problem on its head and seeing where it took them that characterized the early operational research because they were looking at, you know, they have an opponent and they want to figure out what that opponent might want to do next. The other aspect of, of the war effort that was happening was Wiener and Rosenbluth and others were working on the um, anti-aircraft uh, guns so that they would shoot the shoot the gun where the aircraft was going to be, not where it actually was at the moment. So that was, that was something that, that kind of uh, had a big effect on all of them, is this background of OR do, during the war and trying to figure out how to use these new ideas about feedback. Well, in United Steel, one of the things that he was especially interested in was applying neurophysiology to improving the steelworks. So if you go to the Liverpool <coughs> John Moore's collection, you can see he has an electroencephalogram of the steel industry, or of his steel plant. Uh, in the early 60s, he went to Illinois and presented a neurologically based paper called the Cybernetic Factory, which eventually ended up being the work that led to Brain of the Firm. After Stafford left the steel industry, you know, at, when they told him, you know, you've accomplished enough, you know, quiet down now and, you know, you'll get a knighthood or something in a few years, uh, he went into consultancy and as, at the end of that consultancy, he ran into um, a project that a young guy called Fernando Flores in Chile was doing. Uh, Flores was studying operational research. And that led to him being invited to Chile to do the Cybersyn project, which was another totally holistic kind of a, a project where it was not only looking at the factories and the <coughs> output, but also trying to come up with, mo well, with BSM models for most of the recursions. I think they had 11 different recursions in Chile, going down to the individual workshop and up to the national level. But basically they only uh, had an opportunity in those couple of years to model two or three levels. So they had you know, the industry and the sector. But even with that, they were able to uh, manage to go through a gremio strike where despite the fact that a lot of the trucks were taken off because they had these real-time information systems set up on telex, by the way, mostly, uh, they were able to divert the remaining resources, which I think were only about 20%, to getting stuff to people who needed it. And so that was an example of another holistic pattern. In addition to the technical side of things, the, Ch the Chilean Cybersyn project involved a lot of design. So that included things like industrial design of things like tape recorders and cars that would be very simple and would be easy for people in a not very wealthy country to afford. And he was involved with G. Bansiep and others who came out of Germany and the design schools there and came to work in Chile. The other aspect of it was the arts. He wanted there to be 
that science for the people needed to be expressed in artistic fashion as well as technical fashion. And there was a, a song he wrote, which was a litany for a computer and a baby about to be born. So all of these things were essentially, you know, big picture and how do you get the whole society involved? It was a lot of effort uh, directed towards how do we train the factory workers? Because when, the, uh, when Allende won the election, a lot of the factory owners and managers left and took the order books with them. Allende also was proceeding uh, along the same lines that the previous administrations had done in order to uh, nationalize the copper industry, which was a big problem in Chile. Uh, foreign businesses were coming in, not paying the workers very much, not taking very good care of the environment, not even taking very good care to make sure that they left, you know, that they didn't leave a lot of, uh, a lot of ore to be mined by just taking what was easy to get. So there was a, quite an interest in, well, let's nationalize this industry because it's a big earner for us, and uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, we're not getting much benefit from it. That, by the way, was something that, although he was very much in favor of the private sector, somehow Pinochet never got around to unnationalizing the copper industry because it provided too much money. At any rate, we all know that the Chilean experiment was uh, derailed by a coup sponsored by the United States, which was quite we described in a lot of detail in the church hearings in the US Senate of Kissinger wanting to experiment with overthrowing a government that wasn't too close to the US. And so Allende's government was a good, a good choice. Although a former CIA person by the name of Jack Ford once told us that there was an element in the CIA that was trying to get the, the folks to lay off Chile because they wanted to see how the, the cybernetics experiment would, would work out. And of course, they were, they were overruled. There was interest during the Kennedy administration in cybernetics, but uh, Lyndon Johnson did not continue that, uh, nor did Nixon or uh, following, following presidents. Uh, the closest we got, I suppose, in the United States was Jimmy Carter wanting to put solar panels on the White House roof. And he was kind of interested in some of this stuff, but he only had one term and Reagan definitely wasn't interested in it. So here we are now with a lot of the uh, events that Stafford and others predicted, you know, big data, uh, having algorithms that can predict a great many things with a pretty high degree of accuracy, uh, the agent-based modeling, and we have Again, all, a lot of the risks that were identified as far back as Norbert Wiener and the human use of human beings as, you know, what about privacy? What about human rights? What about civil rights? And those things are still very much, uh, very much alive and in fact were a big part of the Norbert Wiener conference that was held at, uh, in Boston a couple of summers ago is looking again at what Wiener uh, was concerned about, which was the same thing that Stafford was concerned about and wrote about in places like Brain of the Firm. Like, what happens if you have a medical, uh, medical ID implanted that not only can the hospital read if you have a medical emergency, but your insurance company, your employer, who else could hack into that? Maybe a drug company who wanted, who thought you might be a good consumer. All of these things like Fitbit were another, another area where an employer, an insurance company, a competitor, a criminal, <coughs> a great many people could hack into and find out exactly what you were doing physiologically at any given time. So that includes things like eating, sleeping, having sex, and exercising so you know if you're not married do you want your employer to know if you're having sex <coughs> if you are supposed to be taking care of yourself uh, do you want your employer to know that you're not exercising like you said you would 
or that you're eating a lot of sugar and carbohydrates. Um, there are all kinds of things here, and they've already had some problems with, for instance, uh, employers keeping a GPS in an employee's car, but actually that the employee owned. This is a case in California. Uh, the employer disciplined the employee for being somewhere the employer didn't think that she should have been, but it was the weekend, and it was her own car and her own gas, and she was suing for invasion of privacy, and I suppose wrongful dismissal, because she said that the GPS that made sense during the work week, because I guess she was a salesperson that had to travel from place to place, and it made sense to know where she was in case they wanted to reroute her, you know, stopped making sense, you know, at 5.30 in, in, in the afternoon on weekdays when she didn't, she didn't want them to know where she was and it wasn't any of their business. One other area where we've already seen problems with the algorithms is that the insurance companies used to send investigators <coughs> and they got involved in all kinds of abuses, particularly around who was considered high risk for for car insurance liability coverage. And they use categories, like what color is the car the person drives, does the person have a nickname, what do their neighbors say about them, which of course is, for the neighbors anyway, is you know like open season for grudges. At any rate, those, those abuses were, were shut down. But now with algorithms, they are able to reinstate an even more precise version of that based on all kinds of external factors that actually have nothing to do with someone's driving. And with respect to people who are apprehended by the criminal justice system, of uh, using algorithms for sentencing. And those algorithms will sentence someone on the basis of the likelihood of reoffense, except what that does is reinforce deprivation, reinforce poverty because the people who are considered most likely to reoffend are the people who are poor, who don't have a strong family support system, you know, who have, who have this, that, and the other thing. Whereas someone who wasn't poor, had a family support system, who could perhaps have committed a worse offense, would not be sent to prison, while someone who was poor would be sent to prison for a longer time, uh, or at all, because they, their algorithm would predict that because of their various demographic ratings, that they would be more likely to reoffend. Um, one thing I kind of skipped over also, which is much more true now than it was, <coughs> is that we now have real possibilities with biological computers, which Stafford tried to do with Daphnia, with water fleas, and those, those didn't work because they fed them iron filings in their, in their leaf mold that they ate. But before they solved the equations, their digestive system had already worked everything through. And so they get to a certain point and all of a sudden, the elimination process would have taken hold and all they would get would be a cloud of debris and no, no equation. At any rate, he was successful using a much more varied uh, pond water uh, computer, quote unquote, that had little lights and little electromagnetic sensors. Um, but all of this stuff, Stafford, Gordon Pask, and others, were essentially doing in the evening or on weekends. Um, Vanilla still tells stories about being driven around to various ponds while he collected pond water for his tank. Uh, so that he could do these experiments. And obviously, without any support and without any, any real uh, criteria, I suppose, of success, um, that's, that, that kind of work kind of, uh, kind of died. But now it is possible, and there are a lot of people doing uh, things with a lot of critters. I've been especially impressed by the slime mold that the transportation engineers have found. Uh, if they place food sources, in uh, proportion to the amount of population in the areas that need to be covered, that the slime mold actually makes better connections than the transport engineers had thought up, and more efficient ones. So that's another aspect. Uh, at any rate, 
what I've, what I've brought with me, which I will share with any of you who put your email on a list, uh, is a page of references to Stafford's work and very closely related work that, uh, that people can look at. Um, it's essentially a one, one page of references, and that will, that will be a way on. There's also some interesting work being done in terms of the history. Eden Medina wrote a history of the whole, uh, whole Chilean thing in a book called Cybernetic Revolutionaries, and Andrew Pickering has a book called The Cybernetic Brain Out, of where Stafford is one of five, I guess, British cyberneticians who's profiled about what they were up to and how they were relating with one another. So this is, I had kind of hoped this would be a little bit interactive, so this is probably a time to start questions and discussion. I can start. Okay. Um, who are you? Uh, my name is Dionis Demetis. I'm a lecturer at the University of Palma. And uh, Alena, thanks for your sort of introductory talk. I just wanted to ask you about the examples you brought in for the algorithms mm -hmm. on the case of the, the current students mm -hmm. and the, I think the other example that you used was the prediction for reoffending. Yes. And I've read somewhere about the first one, but I haven't seen anything about the second. So I was wondering whether, this, whether you have seen a real case of that of algorithms being used to, to sort of judge the offending and whether that is being used as a criterion at some part of the sort of justice system, if you like. <coughs> what I've seen have been newspaper accounts of it. Um, and I think, well, I'm sure they were from the United States, but I think it was judges in the Northeast. Okay. I think one of the challenges with this is that wh whether or not these things are instantiated in, in real machines, silicon and metal, is that we tend to think algorithmically. Mm -hmm. So the extent to which you say, yes, okay, deprivation, weak family support system, and, and the like, tends to suggest free offence. So the, the, even, even in those situations where uh, the judge or the magistrate isn't using the machine in real time, He's actually thinking that way, and this, this uh, the perpetuation of this by the publication of it just reinforces that. So you, you get a situation where we believe that. So we put people from that background in prison, and of course, more of those people go to prison because they're more likely to reoffend. But oh look, they've been to prison more often, which is then going to strengthen the weighting on the back of the algorithm. Yeah, I think one side. I think the other side is the stuff on big data, a lot of the work tends to suggest that uh, neural networks are more powerful than big data in, in dealing with, with big data that moves. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the ability to embed a neural network in, into <coughs> a cybernetic model, with, with, uh, probably most obviously in Ashby's polystable system, mm -hmm. uh, uh, allows you to create a model where these things can move and still address some of Stafford's stuff in Designing Freedom and Venus stuff in the human use of human beings in terms of uh, allowing this stuff to come out and be more open. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that there's an extent to which, you know, if we believe in this stuff, we, we pick up a responsibility to actually make the case for the positives without, you know, it, it, it's easy, isn't it a horrible world? All these nasty people in big business and big government are stamping all over us. Uh, we, the cybernetics community, know better, and, and like Stafford did, and like Norbert Beamer did, we have something of a responsibility to stand up for it yeah. uh, and fight the other side. Oh yeah, and I think no one, no one suggests that having this information isn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, the difference is how do you make sure that it's balanced by attention to civil rights uh, with the offense uh, judgment, one of the things that is possible is even if the judge is inclined to think that, you know, this person is poor, they'll probably reoffend. 
there still is an opportunity for a personal connection between the judge and the offender, where the offender might be able to convince the judge that they w that they would make an effort to go straight. Or that the judge could order the support systems to make sure that they or, did. Or that the judge could put in support systems, or that some other track would be would be offered. And also that there's been quite a lot of work in um, essentially alternative sentencing. Mm -hmm. And that means that nonviolent minor offenders have to pick up trash in the park or something for a certain number of hours. And that keeps them out of jail and the prison system and all of those kinds of things. Uh, so that you know that is generally a good thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, so Michael Grant, um, I do think what you said about it being a good thing about uh, in the UK, for example, uh, mm -hmm. giving people sentences in the community mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> is not necessarily a good thing. What it does is it reinforces ritualistic behaviour, which uh, further perpetuates um, the, the criminal activities. So if you're trying to actually include people into the community, to actually then make them stand apart from the community, which is essentially the ritualistic behaviour, you're, you're actually separating them out. So it doesn't, it actually is um, counterproductive. I've actually worked in the um, criminal justice system itself. The, 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 the issue for me, throughout the criminal justice system, is ideological. Mm -hmm. And it's ideological in terms of a, um, if you don't mind me saying, white male middle class values. Mm -hmm. and, and that is inherent in the system. So, in terms of ritualistic behaviour, you don't see I don't want to do banker bashing or anything like that. You don't see many bankers out there picking up paper. You don't... Be you, nice if we did. Well, absolutely. I mean, if you could actually, if you could actually latch on to them, of course, yeah. you know, they, they, there's a lot of wiggle. wiggle. Yeah. So it, it is, the criminal justice system is very ide ideological produced. Um, I certainly don't disagree with that, although the community sentencing doesn't have to be ritualistic and it doesn't have to be visible. Uh, it could be that someone uh, would be told, you know, join the army or, or enroll in school and show us your report card when you get back. Um, it doesn't, it, some of that is, is, comes under the heading of probation without verdict too where people keep their noses clean and then it's wiped. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways of doing it and there certainly are ideological things. And if you look at a situation like Ferguson, Missouri in the United States where they have had super problems, a lot of that is a, a, essentially a cascading effect because national budgets were cut, state budgets were cut, Municipalities didn't have the money to do what they needed to do. They couldn't politically sell raising taxes. So they began in many communities, I think particularly in the Midwest and South, to fund the municipality on the basis of fees and fines. Now if you're thinking about, you know, parking tickets and that sort of thing, that you know, that's been going on for a long time. But there also have been communities who uh, looked out for out-of-state plates, and these were the people they were going to pull over and give a ticket on some sort of a, uh, some sort of ground, spurious or not. But that that uh, that behavior tended to target minority and poor neighborhoods, where they left the middle-class neighborhoods alone. And the carding and and the uh, the assumption I think that is making. Uh, making the relationship between the police and the community very dicey right now, it seems to be based on an ideological um, stance that particularly young minority males are assumed to be inherently dangerous. Uh, and I had a, a friend who is, uh, who has a mixed race son and they live in a middle class neighborhood in Toronto and you know, 
he gets carded when he's trying to walk home. And no one thinks that this is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs>